I want you to know something. This is going to be the last Sunday that we have to do this online like this. We are going to be resuming services here at Rives on June the 7th, and we're pretty pumped about it. There's some things we want you to do, and so continue to watch our YouTube uh, uh, channel for Rives Baptist Church also has uh, an announcement that JP and I made together, and we're going to be probably making another one this coming Friday. But we're going to be resuming services on June the 7th here at Rives, and we are so excited to be back. Here's what we don't want, and I'm not going to even talk about all the details, because you can get those at another time, but here's what we don't want. We don't want this decision and the things around it to cause division within the church. Uh, people are going to have differing opinions. JP and I were just talking, and he and I have different opinions on some of this stuff, and that's okay. We don't have to agree on all of that. There is something we do have to agree on, and that is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. And so it doesn't make somebody more spiritual if they wear a mask or if they don't wear a mask. It doesn't, we're just, we're in this because we belong to the one who holds it all in his hand. And so today, uh, I'm going to talk to you for a moment, a few minutes here on part three of the series, God's Still Got This. And it ended up that it worked out super for us to finish this series up. And then next Sunday, we start meeting again in person. Uh, in the first week, we saw that when life seems out of control, God's still got this. God uses those times in our life that seem to be the most uncertain, the most uncomfortable for us, in order to grow us. And then two weeks ago, we talked about the peace of God that passes all understanding and how that will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Today... We're going to be talking about how to maintain hope in a world that is hopelessly broken. I know that's not news for you. You know that to be true. I know that to be true. In Psalm 33, verse 22, the psalmist said this, May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let me read it again. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever placed your hope in someone or something, and then only to have that person disappoint you or that circumstance didn't work out the way that you hoped it would? If so, then you understand this. How can you maintain hope in a world that at times seems to be hopelessly broken? Perhaps you stood at an altar. And you vowed before God, your family, and your friends, till death do us part. And you were sincere when that happened. But then your marriage ended in divorce. Maybe you thought that if you worked hard and you did a good job and you treated people like you, like you wanted them to treat you, that you'd have a job at your company until you retired. And then all of a sudden, somebody making a little less money and a little younger came along. And it didn't work out that way. So how do we maintain hope in relationships and with people when promises are made without follow-through? How do you maintain hope when everything around you seems to be in despair and in chaos? How do you maintain hope when the wheels have come off and you're in a position to where you're looking at your situation and it seems to be hopeless? Have you ever sat, found yourself asking questions such as, what's the point of trying? What's the use of loving? How can I continue to go on? The wise man in Proverbs 13, 12 understood how that feels. And maybe you understand how that feels based on your circumstances surrounding this pandemic, uh, your marriage, your job, your health, and whatever. Proverbs 13, verse 12 uh, the Bible says, unrelenting, this is a, from a paraphrase, unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. So what is hope? Let me define it so we know what I'm talking about this morning. Hope 
is an expectation or a desire for a certain thing to happen. It's a, um, it's a uh, expectation or desire for a certain thing to happen. As you look to your future, you have hope regarding the people around you. Uh, maybe you're young uh, and not married yet and have hopes that one day you'll marry, one day you'll have kids. Uh, you have hopes maybe to go to college. Maybe you have hopes to have a lot of grandkids that will come around and, and uh, show their love to you. We have hopes in our parents. You have hopes in husbands and wives, your boss, your kids, your neighbors. You have hopes, expectations. In most cases, those are unspoken. Also, your hope could be in your education or a particular skill or ability that you have or a particular job or your appearance or your income. Maybe your hope is in your health, that you'll have good health. And boy, that certainly is something to value. But I want you to picture this morning, this is an illustration that I want to use this morning. I want you to picture hope as though it is a ladder. And we make decisions to lean that ladder up against certain people or certain things. Like we would lean a ladder up against the wall. My grandson came over uh, last week sometime and was helping with cleaning gutters. And uh, we helped him move the ladder around, and he climbed up the ladder and cleaned the gutters. Hope is kind of like a ladder. We were all born uh, with hope. We didn't even realize at the time, but when you were born, when I was born, all of our hope leaned against our mom or our parents. It wasn't a conscious decision on our part. It was something that uh, all our hope for the future rested in their ability to care and provide for us. We couldn't do anything for ourselves. If we were going to eat, our hope was in our mom. If we were going to not have our diaper full all the time, our hope was in our mom or dad, that they would help us and change us. If we were going to be clean when we were first born, our hope lied completely in them. But as you get older, you begin to move your ladder of hope and you begin to lean it up against other people and other things. Maybe you began to lean your ladder of hope up against uh, a girl that you were dating or a guy that you were dating. Maybe you began to lean your ladder of hope up against uh, an education. And you were hoping that that education would enable you to get a job that you wanted to go. Maybe a teacher or a coach. You began to lean that ladder of hope up, up against them. Maybe... Maybe you wanted to play sports and you had this dream that you could play sports at a very high level and your coach began to be someone that you began to have hope in her or hope in him. All along the journey, we choose different things and different people to lean our ladder of hope against. And these aren't so much, as I said, conscious decisions. However, we become aware of them when things get hopeless. We, for, let me give you an example. We become aware that we were leaning our ladder of hope. We had hopes of our spouse. And when they failed to meet our hopes or our expectations, then we realize that we had hope in them. We don't think so much necessarily about good health and the hope that we have for good health until we get that diagnosis. We don't think that we had hope in our uh, financial resources until 30% of our 401k is gone in a matter of a couple weeks. These are when we find out that we have leaned our ladder of hope against people or put our hope in people, put our hope in things that are not going to sustain us. Hopelessness is the feeling we get when we lean our ladder of hope against people or things that do not come through with us. Someone else gets the job. You can't get pregnant. I know there, we have some friends that are struggling with that right now. And your hope, if it's leaned against the fact that I'm going to get pregnant and you don't get pregnant, what do you do with that? If that's where you've placed your hope, remember what the psalmist said. He said in, or excuse me, the wise man of Proverbs, when he, no, it is Psalms. Hang on, let me get up there. Psalm 33, 22. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So maybe you get a word that your job is one of the ones 
that wasn't essential. Or maybe you have to file for bankruptcy. Or maybe your, your marriage is constant tension. We can experience hopelessness when we, the things that we have leaned our ladder against fail to meet up to our expectation. Nobody expected for our world to become what it has become during this pandemic. There's a lot of hopelessness out there because we had hoped, even though it was not conscious, we had hoped that something like this would not happen. So how do I maintain hope? How do I continue to try? How long can I continue to love and continually be hurt? We've all had the rug pulled out from underneath us, especially in these days. And you will again, and I will again. Maybe the death of someone that, that we love and we realize that, that our hope was that they would be around for the rest of our life, and they're not. We can't control uh, certain things, and when our hope is leaned up against these things like a ladder and we choose to lean our hope up against it, and it falls down, it's disappointing. I remember one time I was working a security job, and I was up on the top of a six-story building that I was at, and I was looking at the building next door, and I started to hear some strange noises. It was probably a two- or three-story building. And all of a sudden, the whole facade on the front of that building fell off while I was looking, and it uh, crushed the cars down below. Can you imagine if somebody had a ladder leaned up against that wall at the time that it fell down like that? Well, the truth is, many times we lean our hope, our expectations, instead of allowing them to be on the Lord, we allow our hope to be in certain lesser things, things that are not going to stand the test of time and over which we have no control. That's why this thing of the virus is so uh, anxiety inducing for so many. We have no control over it. We have no control over the economy, no control over our governor, no control over our president, no control over our health. I mean, we can do the right things, but we ultimately, we don't have control over that. No control over our spouse. We certainly have no control of our kids. Just kidding. Uh, we have no control over protesters. And so all of these things, when they fail to meet our expectations, it diminishes our hope. And we become hopeless in many cases. We've all leaned our ladder of hope against something. And the question is, how do you maintain hope in circumstances that seem to be hopeless? In the Bible, we are repeatedly uh, told that we ought to put our hope in the Lord, that we ought to lean our ladder of hope against our Heavenly Father, who will not disappoint us. Let me read Psalm 33, 22 again. May your, look at this, unfailing love, that is a love that will never diminish. That's a love that will never disappoint. That's a love that will never cause us to be hopeless. Look at the worst time of your life the time when you were living the most far from God, God still loved you and me with an unfailing love. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Where is a believer's hope supposed to be? It's supposed to be in God. Um, you're going to have good things happen in your life from the people around you. And they, they are going to be a blessing to your life. But your hope is never to be there. Let me share a practical example of what it means to put your hope in somebody or something. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, Timothy said this. He said, or Paul said this to Timothy. He said, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. Okay? So he says, don't be prideful. Don't be arrogant, and don't put your hope in wealth, which is, look what it says, so uncertain. We should not put our hope in wealth because it is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Is it a good thing to have a job? Yes, yeah, certainly is. Is it a good thing to have promotion, to have a job that pays you what you need, and maybe even a little more? It is. 
But that's not where our hope is supposed to be. How do we put our hope in wealth? We put our hope in wealth when we look to our bank balance for financial security rather than looking to God, the one who said, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We think that if we save enough and we work hard enough that we'll always have enough. And sometimes that's not true because wealth is so uncertain. How can our uh, hope, in, if it's put in wealth, be disappointed? It can be disappointed when we stop getting a paycheck. It can be disappointed when the Dow takes a major hit. It can be disappointed when our medical expenses are through the roof and we don't know how we're going to pay them. Or we have a major repair that needs to be done to our house and we don't know how we're going to do it. As Americans, we believe that there's hope in getting a good education. There is a value in getting a good education, but we should never put our hope in a good education. If we think there's a value or a hope in working hard and working hard on our relationships. And if you're a believer, you may lean your ladder of hope up against some of these things, hoping that they will sustain you in times that are hopeless. But what we find is it doesn't really matter how well educated we are, how hard we work, how well we plan for the future. We live in a hopelessly broken world. And that brokenness repeatedly has a negative effect on us. You can do your best. You can plan for the future. You can take care of yourself physically. And you can work hard at creating a stable life for you and your family. But at some point, we have to realize that nothing is secure in this world except God himself. That's it. That doesn't mean we, you know, sit in the woods somewhere and just meditate on scripture and pray and that's our life. No, we have, we have certain things that we have to do. We have to provide for our family. We have to take care of ourselves physically. We have to save for retirement. We have to do all of these things, but our hope should never lie in those things. We should never make the decision to take the ladder of hope and lean it against other lesser things besides God himself. We have to be involved in them, but we don't want to lead our ladder there. Now, in the passage we're going to look at this morning from Romans chapter 8, probably the best chapter in the whole Bible, Paul explains the futility of leaning our ladder of hope against anything that's temporary in this world. So he explains where our hope should be, and he tells us why it's so important for us to put our hope in the Lord. He goes back to a time when God created the earth and everything was perfect, and then sin entered the world. Uh, when the Bible speaks about sin, it's not talking about so much something that was done, although it does mention that too. But it's talking about our sin nature, that is, our, the nature that we receive from Adam because he sinned and, and Eve sinned. Not only did it impact the human race, but it impacted everything in the whole world. In Romans 8, verse 20, it says this, For the creation was subjected to futility. The creation was subjected to futility. Because it's a sinful world now, it can be a very futile or pointless or useless place to be. To live in this sinful, sinful world is a lesson in frustration. Yeah, I'm preaching to the choir now because many of you listen to this, understand this better than I do. He goes on to say in verse 20 and 21, he says, The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. That is, the creation didn't decide to be futile, but because of him who subjected them. When God created it, everything was perfect, and man decided to sin at a time when everything in this world was functioning flawlessly. But it became the subject of futility by God because of sin. He goes on, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. Now, in the Bible, uh, it's created, it's um, formatted in verses. 
these verses are not uh, part of the inspiration. They were added later on. So actually, the thought begins with the last two words of verse 20 and continues on into verse 21. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage. In other words, we hope and we would like and we have expectations that, that it would be a real blessing if, if this world was a little more ordered and a little more flawless and a little more less or a little less futile. We would like that. That the creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We would like to see this world set free from its bondage to sin. All of us would. But everything in the world is decaying and ultimately dying. You and I know this because we're getting older. And we look in the mirror. And we can see that, you know, below the eye, it's starting to fall down, and we're getting wrinkles and all kinds of stuff because this is a futile place and a decaying place to live. You eat right, you exercise, you take vitamins, you get regular physicals, and everybody around you thinks that you look young for your age, but you're still going to die. Because that's this world that we live in. And you might need you might be able to slow it down a little bit. Not really. Because when it's your time, it's your time. The coronavirus is just another piece of evidence that supports the fact that our world is hopelessly broken. Uh, people can enjoy life with many memories. And I hope you're making memories even during this time of this virus. But the truth is... Many times we have leaned our ladder of hope against things that will disappoint us. The reason we lean our ladder against the wrong people and the wrong things is because we think that they are that, that we are somehow going to be the exception to the rule or beat the odds. Others may get sick, but I won't. Others may lose their job, but I won't. But we don't beat the odds. The wise man in Proverbs said that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That is, bad stuff happens to all kinds of people. And if your ladder of hope is leaning up against things, that could disappoint you, that could change, then you're going to be disappointed. Notice how he describes creation. He says, we know, that is, this is a certain fact, that the whole creation, this is Romans 8, 22, the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. That is, this world's described as being uncomfortable, as being groan-inducing, as being painful. Can you relate to that? Maybe you're experiencing that, those same kinds of pains in your own life and you're thinking, man, God, when am I going to get a break? When are things going to change? When, when is my hope not going to be dif disappointing? And when, when am I not going to be heart sick because of what's going on around me in my life? Verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly. As we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope, that is the hope that we can have eternal life with God forever, in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? That is, what he's saying there is we have a hope, and it's not something that we can visualize right now, but we hope for it. We hope that we will be able to visualize it. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The truth is, children are born, good stuff happens. Weddings take place, promotions are received. She says yes, you get the job. There are times when our investments grow and on and on and on. And there are aspects of this life that at times can be very good. But the truth is, those are not the things against which we should place our hope. But it's not all bad news. Look at Romans 8, verse 26. He says, Likewise, or in the same way, the Spirit helps us 
Here it is. In our weakness. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever been in a position where you, you knew you needed to pray, and you shut your eyes perhaps, or perhaps you're driving down the road and you wanted to pray, and it just seemed like there was your grief was so heavy, your hopelessness was so real, that you were not able to pray. You couldn't even think of the words and your mind was just at a standstill. That's the time when the Holy Spirit himself, himself, intercedes for you and I with groanings that are too deep for words. In times that would threaten to cause us to lose hope, in times when we don't know how to pray, in times when we have this huge void and this huge blockage that we can't verbalize, God, in the form of the Holy Spirit, prays for us. He understands how we're feeling, he knows everything about us, and he sympathizes with us. Look what it says in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? Okay, got all this talk about hope. What are we going to say about it? Here it is. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let me phrase that in a way. If God is for us, nobody can stand against us. Yeah, but this virus is, is just so far reaching and people, our nation is divided over, over how we ought to respond to it. And I'm just sick of it. If God is for you, who can stand against you? Yeah, but... My wife and I were just fussing all the time, and the kids, my goodness, they've been, they've been like little hellions running around the house. If God is for us, who can stand against us? What does it mean that God is for us? How can we be certain that God is for us? I mean, really, Dyke, I'm wondering if God truly is for me. I mean, look what's happening in my life right now. I got people around me that are sick. I got people around me that are losing their mind. I got people around me that are that are angry all the time. I've got I've lost my job. I don't have a check coming in. I can't get the unemployment to activate. And on and on and on and on. And you're saying that God is for me. How do I know that God is for me? Because it sure doesn't seem like God is for me. The very next verse. Romans 8.32 He, that is God, who did not spare his own son, that is Jesus, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? As God becomes the focus of our hope, you will never be disappointed. Yeah, but I'm disappointed. I feel hopeless. It's because you've chosen to lean your ladder against things that are not hope rated. You've leaned your ladder up against your spouse. Or you've leaned your ladder against the good job. Or you've leaned your ladder against the good health. And for a minute or two, you could have hope in that. Not a lasting hope, though. Because you can lose your health, you can lose your job, you can lose your spouse. So we need to lean our ladder or center our expectations in the love of our Heavenly Father. And when you lean your ladder of hope against your Heavenly Father and your Heavenly Father only, you will never be disappointed. Then he brings it to a huge finish as he closes out this chapter in Romans 8 verse 38. He says, for I am sure, okay, he's saying this is something that's positive. You can take this to bank, to the bank. I am sure. Now remember who wrote this, the Apostle Paul. He's been snake bit. He's been shipwrecked. He's been lost at sea. He's been falsely accused. He's been imprisoned. And he was ultimately beheaded because of his refusal to stop talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet here he is near the end of his life, convinced without doubt, I am sure that neither death, 
nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. Look at this next phrase. Nor anything else in all creation. Okay, he's naming a lot of stuff. It's pretty powerful stuff. But then he says nothing else in all of the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I uh, am very afraid of heights. Uh, when I was uh, teaching school back in California in the 1980s, I painted houses for a living. I remember painting a house. Uh, in fact, it was uh, Mark, uh, Mark Schmidt, our missionary to Guatemala. It was his parents' house. And it was a two-story house, had a walkout on the back, and I was painting from a ladder 40 feet up. I was not confident at all in that ladder. And I, I, I didn't have confidence in the ladder. I didn't have confidence that I could stay up on the ladder. I was paralyzed by my fear. Let me say this. If you lean the ladder of hope up against your Heavenly Father, He will never disappoint you. You may have times when you're uncomfortable, but His unfailing love will always be there for you. Let me add some things to this. That, uh, that will not be able to separate you from the love of God. Not a pandemic, not a divorce, not an unhappy marriage, not a difficult job, not job loss, not illness, not troubled kids. I've spoken with people recently whose children have walked away completely from their faith, and their hearts are broken by it. That cannot separate you from the love of God. Let me say this. I'll go a step further. That cannot separate your kids from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The relationship has changed, but his love for them is not. It Not raising your grandkids because your kids are not able to do it for one reason or another. Not a failing economy, not loneliness, not fear, not pain, not abuse, not rejection, not uncertainty for the future not betrayal, not a terminal diagnosis, not a painful breakup, not an affair. Nothing in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus is hope rated. You can lean your ladder up against him and never, ever, ever be disappointed. You may be uncomfortable at times, you may be uncertain because of the circumstances of your life. You may be disappointed, but you don't ever need to be hopeless when you have a Heavenly Father whose unfailing love for you is always going to be there. You can't come up with anything that could interrupt His love for you. So Romans 8, 38 and 39, uh, he talks about all of these things, and none of them will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, regardless of how painful, how sinful, how intentionally hurtful that circumstance is. You couldn't find anything to place in that verse where God would say, oh, I didn't think of that. Okay, You think, yeah, God, but th that affair, that just devastated me. You know what? When I was writing that, I didn't even think of an affair. You're right. An affair can separate you from my love. He's not going to say, like I mentioned uh, in a previous message, you know, when your loved one is murdered. God isn't going to say, you know what? I didn't think of that. In fact, he starts out, in life, neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God. Nothing else in all creation. But I don't feel connected to God's love. Your feelings are irrelevant in determining that. You are connected in God's love. But I don't sense that God's at work in my life and circumstances. Again, your feelings do not determine that. God is at work, and his unfailing love for you will always be something that you can be hopeful in. If we're disappointed, if we're hopeless, it's because we have had expectations in things that are not hope rated. And I know that seems cut and dry and black and white, 
But you want to put your hope in something that will not disappoint you. You want to put your hope in something that is secure. You want to put your hope in something that you can go to and depend on every single time without fail. That means you have to move your ladder of hope away from your husband or wife and put it only on your Heavenly Father. And your Heavenly Father will help you work on the relationship with your husband or wife. And that can improve but your hope doesn't need to be that it will improve. What does it mean for us as we wait for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ? It means we work hard at our relationships, raising our kids and grandkids. We work hard at our jobs. We do our best with what God's given us, where he's put us. We love the people around us like Jesus loves us. We forgive as we've been forgiven. We realize that we have put, put our hope in things and in people that we, we cannot have unfailing hope in. And we have to keep moving that ladder back. You get the good job. You're excited about it. You get to get a different vehicle. Maybe you get to get a different house. Maybe you can pay your bills. Be careful. Don't put your hope in that. Make sure your hope stays firmly leaned against your Heavenly Father. Because we get in trouble when we place our expectations on things that waffle and things over which we have no control. That means that if you have the perfect day, uh, we, we, uh, we were around some of our grandkids recently. I know we probably shouldn't, but we were around some of our grandkids recently, and, and, and a couple of them said, this has been the best day ever. Okay, if you have the best day ever, and the circumstances are good, and the sun's shining, at the end of the day, you thank God, and you acknowledge that your hope remained in Him. It did not remain in that. It, 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 you and I will never be hopeless if we continue to keep our ladder leaned against the one who is hope-rated. Psalm 33, verse 2. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Okay, let me get real here. If you're hoping that your husband or your wife is going to come in the door one day and say, Honey, you are right. I was wrong. For the last 25 years, all the arguments that we've had have been my fault. Please forgive me. If your hope is in that, I mean, it would be a nice thought. It would be wonderful if it happened. We need more of that in marriages. But I wouldn't lean my ladder there. Because if you lean your ladder there, and your husband or wife doesn't come in the door and apologize and say that they were wrong and all the arguments that you've had uh, over the 25 years have been their fault, you're going to be hopeless. Because you had an expectation from them that, that things would be different. Okay? And if, you, if you're expecting or you have a hope that because they were the major offender in this incident that they would apologize first, and you have a hope in that, and they don't apologize first, you're going to be hopeless. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. If you're going to hope that nobody in your circle of influence gets COVID-19, and that's your hope, and someone does, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed anyway. But that's not where... Hope is something that ought to be reserved for God himself. And we need to keep... And this is a repeated decision that we make. We, we realize when we interact with our wives or our spouse... When we interact with our kids and we, they disappoint us, we realize that we had hopes and dreams for things and people, that they would turn out a certain way, and they don't. And then we realize, oh, I had my ladder leaning there. I'm going to take that ladder, and I'm going to move it to the one that causes me so much hope and whose unfailing love will support me all of my life. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord. How does that happen? 
even as we put our hope in you. The reason that we lose hope, the reason that we're disappointed, the the reason that we're heart sick and we want to give up many times is because we've leaned our ladder of hope against someone or something that is broken and will disappoint us eventually. So my word for you today is this. Do not hope in anyone or anything else but God himself. The, the, the old hymn says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I don't remember the rest. I will not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name until the time goes. Old people forget stuff. But you know what? These are not to be hopeless days. These could be hopeless days if we lean our hope on something other than the one who is full of hope. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your love for us. We're so thankful, Lord, that you love us and that your unfailing love will rest upon us even as we put our hope in you. God, I pray that people would realize today that we have placed our hope in too many people and too many things that are not God. And because of that, our hope has been deferred, and we are heartsick over it. And instead of griping and complaining and being full of anxiety and fear, we need to take the ladder of hope, remove it from those things that we've leaned it against, and move it back to our Heavenly Father, the only one who gives us unfailing love, unfailing hope in this life. God, we go through difficult things. And we understand that you allow those for our growth and for your good. But God, we pray that you would help us not to lose sight of the fact that our ladder of hope needs to be leaned on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I am looking forward to getting back to church. And uh, back to seeing you again. Back to seeing people who perhaps were not here when the doors closed ten weeks ago who can be back with us, and we're going to see God do some really amazing things in these days. And he's going to help us to be the church. And it's going to be the church that's full of hope because we have a God who gives us hope, and our hope is built on him. I pray you have a great day today, and uh, listen in on Facebook Tuesday through Friday mornings at uh, 10 o'clock or thereabouts. I'll look forward to uh, sharing some things with you there. And we're going to get back at this, and we're going to establish some new rhythms in life, and God's been good to us, and so let's uh, continue to place our hope in.